In Chapter 6, we are going to look at groups, networks, and organizations. We will discuss the variety and characteristics of sociological groups, as well as the effect that groups have on individual behavior. We will define an organization and understand how organizations developed over the last two centuries. We will look at some theoretical perspectives, including Max Weber's theory of organizations and view of bureaucracy. We will discuss the importance of the physical setting of organizations and Michael Foucault's theory of surveillance. We've already looked at surveillance when we saw the video clip which mentioned that parents can use smartphones as a way to surveil their children. Sociologists are interested in surveillance because it's related to power structures and it can affect the way people act. We'll also look at social networks and how they are beneficial to us. Let's begin by looking at social groups. A social group is a collection of people who regularly interact with one another on the basis of shared expectations concerning behavior and who share a sense of common identity. Many of us are members of multiple social groups at the same time, whether they be family, a friendship, a sports team, a workplace, or the sociology class. A social group is different from a social aggregate. A social aggregate is simply a collection of people who happen to be together in a particular place but don't share an identity and don't interact regularly with one another. An example of a social aggregate is a crowd of people waiting in line outside a theater. A social group is also not the same thing as a social category. A social category includes people who share a common characteristic but do not necessarily interact or identify with one another. For example, athletes or lawyers would each be a social category. A person may call themselves an athlete or a lawyer, but they aren't a member of a social group unless they regularly interact and identify with other athletes on a team or other lawyers in a law firm. What makes the group on the left a social aggregate and the people on the right a social group? One way to classify social groups is as a primary or secondary group. Primary groups are usually small groups of people with whom we engage in face-to-face -face interaction, feel an emotional bond, and to whom we have a strong sense of commitment. Primary groups can be demanding in terms of the time and devotion they demand of us. One's sense of self may derive strongly from membership in a primary group, so much so that it may be hard to separate the self from the group. Examples of primary groups are friendships and families. Secondary groups are impersonal and usually large. An example of a secondary group would be this sociology class. Secondary groups seldom require emotional and powerful connections with other members. Because secondary groups exist to perform some function, members of secondary groups play designated roles. Many secondary groups have written rules. Examples of secondary groups are sports teams, the college classroom, or the workplace. Primary groups often develop out of second group, secondary group memberships. Sociologists have long been interested in the tendency for people to conform. The events of World War II, particularly the Nazi genocide of Jews, Catholics, Roma, and others deemed undesirable, raised a lot of questions about conformity. Why did people carry out tasks that they knew were wrong? Why did people submit so readily to authority? Solomon Ash's research in 1952 revealed that even with simple tasks for which the stakes are low, people conform to group expectations. When asked to match lines on a page, as seen in figure 6.1 above, 
One third of ASHA's research subjects chose the line that clearly was not the same length simply because others in the group who were in on the experiment told them it was the same length. As a Jewish man, Stanley Milgram, 1963, had his own questions about Germans' willingness to submit to Nazi authorities. As an American, he wanted to know how obedient Americans were. In his now infamous experiment, Milgram found that Americans playing the role of the teacher in his experiment were able to deliver high voltage electric shocks to learners who had given the wrong answer to a test question. The learners were in on the experiment. As the shocks became more severe, they pretended to feel more and more pain. Despite signs of distress, pain, and even silence indicating possible death, teachers continued to apply increasingly more severe shocks. Many teachers became upset as the experiment progressed and said they wanted to stop. An authority figure in a lab coat told them to continue and that they'd be absolved of responsibility for any harm that came to the learners. Milgram's research helped people understand the explanations that many ordinary Germans gave for participating in the Holocaust. They were just following orders. You will view a short clip on this experiment in today's class.